Psoriasis, not just flaky skin. Objectives. After the completion of this presentation, the viewer should be able to describe the pathophysiology, frequency, and implications of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, to be able to outline the non-pharmacological methods used to treat psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, and to compare and contrast the most common medications used to treat psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, including mechanisms of action and potential side effects. Psoriatic disease is a chronic autoimmune condition that affects the skin, usually just referred to as psoriasis or skin psoriasis, and joints, often referred to as psoriatic arthritis or abbreviated PA. Psoriasis is characterized by fast and uncontrolled growth of skin cells, which leads to patches of thick and inflamed red skin covered by silvery or whitish scales. These patches are typically found on the arms, legs, head, scalp, but they can be found almost anywhere else also. These patches are also typically found on the, I guess you could say, the front of joints. For example, the front of the knee and the shin, more so than behind the knee or the calf. The same thing with the elbows. They're on usually the behind on the elbow near the joint, as opposed to the front where there is uh, where the able where the elbow is able to flex. There are five different types of psoriasis, uh, but the most common is called plaque psoriasis. Psoriatic arthritis, or PA, is an inflammatory joint condition, and it occurs up to 30% of the time with skin psoriasis. Some sources say between 10 and 20%, other sources say between 20 and 30% of the time. So let's just say up to 30%. Why does it occur? Well, the most commonly accepted explanation is that it's triggered when the immune system sends so-called faulty signals to skin cells, which causes them to grow too quickly. These new skin cells form in days rather than the normal cycle of weeks, and the body does not or cannot shed these excess skin cells, so they end up piling up on the surface, causing patches to appear that are whitish or silvery in color. It's important to note that psoriasis is not contagious, it can't be contracted from touching another person or exchanging body fluids. According to the current medical authorities, there is no single cause or cure for psoriasis disease. According to the National Psoriasis Foundation, it's the most common autoimmune disorder in the United States, affecting up to 7.5 million people. So what exactly is an autoimmune disease? Well, in the standard medical model, an autoimmune condition occurs because certain cells of the immune system, whether they be leukocytes or lymphocytes, are thought to malfunction, either due to genetic factors that affect lymphocyte production and or function directly, or genes that impact connective tissue types, and with psoriasis we're talking about skin cells, or these genetic issues can cause hormone imbalance within autoimmune diseases also. Autoimmune disease is classically viewed as a self versus self battle, but self antigens can't be removed from the body, so chronic uh, inflammation persists. Psoriasis disease is actually classified as a T cell mediated disease because these types of lymphocytes become activated and lodged within the skin and cause the issues. T-cell activation triggers an immune response that leads to the development of skin lesions, but it's not exactly clear why this happens. These T-cells become activated by two interactions. Number one, an antigen-presenting cell, or APC, processes and displays an antigen on its surface which of course is recognized and targeted by the T-cell. Although the actual specific antigen or antigens responsible for this disease are not known. The other interaction is when the APC presents the antigen to the T-cell. Other receptors on the APC and T-cell must interact and they essentially fit together like a lock and key. 
and this mechanism is referred to as the co-stimulatory pathway. These T cells then move from the dermis to the epidermis and release cytokines, which are probably best described as communication proteins, and they stimulate the skin cells, or keratinocytes, to reproduce and mature at an accelerated rate. These cells grow faster, they move to the surface and pile up as dead cells. It's also important to note that epidermal blood vessels expand and multiply. These cytokines also promote an inflammation response. As mentioned, the most common type of skin psoriasis occurring in about 80% of patients is called plaque psoriasis or psoriasis vulgaris. It often appears on elbows, knees, lower back, and scalp, as we can see in the graphic to the right. It's characterized by the thick red patches of skin with this silvery or white layer of scale. And we'll focus most on this type uh, in this webinar today. And there's an established genetic connection and some recognized triggers. The second most common type occurring in about 10% of patients is called gutate. And it's characterized by small red spots, usually on the trunk and limbs, but also around the head, ears, what have you. Often occurs during childhood, and usually after a trigger of a strep throat infection, some sort of a skin injury, from taking new medications. Glutate psoriasis may clear up in a few weeks or months without treatment, but it also responds to treatment much like the plaque variety. It's important to note that sometimes psoriasis changes from one type to another. Another type is called inverse or flexural psoriasis. It often appears within skin folds, such as those under the breasts, within the armpits, buttocks, or groin. It's more common in people who are obese, and the sweat and moisture in those folds prevents the shading of skin scales. And this creates irritation and soreness in the skin surface. And it looks like very red, smooth patches, almost uh, like the skin is raw. Another type is called pustular psoriasis, characterized by red skin dotted with pus-filled bumps. Usually occurs in the hands and feet, but can occur around the body also. The pus inside these blisters is not infectious, but in extreme cases, medical attention is necessary. And what happens is these pus-filled bumps eventually dry and leave behind brown dots or even scale on the surface of the skin. The rarest form of skin psoriasis is erythrodermic, also called exfoliative, and it often looks like the skin is burned because it turns bright red and is widespread, usually all across the back or the legs. With this, very often the body cannot maintain its normal temperature range, so the person experiences lots of hot or cold flashes, and this is typically a, a medical emergency also. As a final point, uh, some people can get more than one type of psoriasis at the same time. As I mentioned, we'll be sticking with the plaque type of psoriasis, so let's discuss some of the signs and symptoms with that type. The main symptom, of course, is re raised reddish and inflamed patches on the skin called plaques. And we can see in the graphic to the right of the elbows, uh, note that it's on the, you could say, outside of the elbow, where the joint extends as opposed to the inside of the arm. These patches are covered with a silvery white coating that dermatologists call scale, and it's essentially a buildup of dead cells. The patches can appear anywhere on the body and are known to be very itchy. However, scratching these patches often causes them to get even thicker, and the patches will eventually crack and sometimes even bleed. Patches vary in size. They can appear separately, as on the right elbow in the graphic, or they can be joined together to make one large patch. Psoriasis of the feet and hands usually involve nail problems, pitting, crumbling, falling off, and this looks very uh, similar to a fungal infection, or sometimes even um, it can mimic uh, mineral deficiencies also. Psoriasis in general is linked to an increased risk of cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, 
chronic infection, and depression. Depression not due to hormonal imbalance per se, but just the idea of having a condition that doesn't look good, that itches, that dis disrupts lifestyle, etc. Um, just like severe acne or other disfiguring skin problems can lead to depression. Well, uh, genetics are assumed to play a significant role in the development of psoriasis, but it's not known to what extent. Uh, it has been found that 10% of the general U.S. population inherits one or more of these genes, um, and I think the most common one there is loci PSORS1, but of that 10%, only 2-3% to develop the disease. There are many known environmental quote-unquote triggers that interact with the genetic predisposition to create psoriasis, and these are stress, it can cause psoriasis to flare or aggravate existing symptoms, any type of skin injury, and that involves uh, cuts, abrasions, insect bites, severe burns, chemical burns, sunburns, even vaccinations. Uh, overall, this is called Kobner ph uh, phenomenon. Infections, particularly strep throat or candida thrush, can trigger psoriasis. A uh, number of medications, especially lithium, a variety of anti-malarials, iodides, and certain beta blockers used to treat hypertension, in particular Indoral. Other triggers include smoking, uh, drinking lots of alcohol, excessively cold weather, a variety of dietary factors, allergies, and even obesity may worsen symptoms of psoriasis. Psoriasis is considered mild if it's covering less than 3% of the body, and this comprises anywhere from the estimates are 65 to 75 or 80% of cases, let's say a 70% average. Uh, psoriasis is considered moderate if it's uh, covering between 3 and 10%, and severe if it's over 10%. And these categories are somewhat useful for selecting which treatments may be the most appropriate. This isn't the only measure of severity. There's other factors that, um, that affect the quality of life, how a person perceives it. Some people are simply more sensitive to how they look than others, for example. Eczema is often confused for psoriasis and vice versa, but there are many notable differences. First of all, psoriasis plaques are quite well defined, whereas in eczema, the plaques or lesions are flatter and less defined. Uh, eczema occurs in different locations, or at least locations that are very unusual for psoriasis, such as the front of the elbows or behind the knees, like I'd mentioned earlier. And uh, when biopsied, the psoriasis lesions look much thicker and inflamed than they would with eczema. And here in the graphic, we see eczema on the left, psoriasis on the right. Psoriatic arthritis, commonly abbreviated PA. PA often begins with just a few swollen joints, such as a single finger or toe. There's joint stiffness upon waking in the morning but it typically quickly fades with movement or activity. And in the early stages of PA, this mimics osteoarthritis, or OA. And another commonality with OA is that low back pain is common during this stage. With progressive PA, there's increased inflammation. And at this stage, it can mimic rheumatoid arthritis. And it can be, become quite uh, painful and with lots of deformity of the joints. Most people develop PA between 5 to 10 years after developing uh, the initial skin symptoms of psoriasis. However, some people get PA and psoriasis together or develop the arthritis before the skin lesions. Like rheumatoid arthritis, PA has acute flare-ups and periods of remission. And again, PA of the hands and feet often include pitted and crumbly nails that can mimic fungal infections or severe uh, mineral deficiencies. Of course, when a doctor attempts to diagnose psoriasis, a medical history and physical exam are important. And this is to establish possible genetic connections and also to check for the characteristic skin symptoms 
and often joint pain that it occurs in up to 30% of those patients. And the doctor will, will carefully uh, look at the scalp, hands, and nails, which are all characteristic spots for psoriasis to affect. The doctor will also ask about any known triggers. For example, if the patient is under a lot of stress, had a new illness such as a strep infection, any type of skin injury, or if they had just started new medications. Blood tests don't rule in the psoriasis, but they can rule it out. You'd be looking for uh, markers for infections or rheumatoid factor that would signify the arthritic symptoms or more RA than PA. The best thing to do to really rule it in is a skin biopsy. Here a dermatologist removes some skin and examines it carefully under a microscope, and this is to confirm the diagnosis. Under the microscope, this skin will show clubbed reach ridges, which is that kind of downward, wavy, thicker epidermal condition that I had talked about earlier. Another positive sign for psoriasis uh, is that there is pinpoint bleeding once the plaques are scraped, and this is known as Ospitz's sign. X-rays can be uh, helpful, of course, but uh, PA with x-ray is very similar to RA. It's, uh, if you can rule it out, if there's no rheumatoid factor in a blood test, and you're seeing joint destruction, uh, erosion of bone and cartilage, then that's certainly a positive indication that there is PA along with the skin lesions. In the United States, about 7.5 million people have psoriasis, which is 2.1% of the adult population. It seems to be most common in the northeastern states, such as New York, Connecticut, Maine, Rhode Island, so there could be a climate connection there. Compared to the UK, uh, prevalence is lower among adults there at 1.5%. Psoriasis can begin at any age, although most people who have it are between the ages of 15 and 30, at least that's when they develop it. Uh, for the infants and the children that develop it, they're much more likely to develop the gutate psoriasis, and uh, they're more likely to be triggered by uh, strep infections or uh, drug reactions. Psoriasis prevalence in African Americans is only 1.3% compared to Caucasians at 2.5%, and the psoriasis appears equally in both men and women, and males and females in general. For people with mild psoriasis, which is estimated to be about 70-75% of those people, and these people have isolated small patches maybe on the hands, feet, elbow, scalp, topical treatments are effective, and usually that's all that, that's needed. And these can include over-the-counter prescription moisturizers, creams, ointments, soaps, shampoos, etc. However, treating more serious or more moderate to severe uh, psoriasis usually involves a combination of, of, of strategies and uh, protocols. And in addition to topical treatments, systemic medication, this can include so-called biologic drugs, uh, also nutritional and possibly herbal supplements, and often some form of phototherapy or light therapy is needed to control or eliminate the plaques. Okay, let's start with some of the natural approaches to psoriasis. Certainly lifestyle changes are important, maintaining a healthy weight, practicing good hygiene, making sure the skin is clean, protecting the skin from trauma, abuse, uh, sunburn for example, stopping smoking, reducing drinking of alcohol. Uh, these are all things that not only prevent severity but may also prevent uh, flare-ups. Avoiding allergens, uh, corrosive chemicals, detergents, and adopting a natural diet. Gluten-free works for a lot of people. Uh, and by natural, I mean maybe more raw foods, fresh fruits and veggies. Some physical treatments can be important. Acupuncture, uh, quite effective for arthritic pain, inflammation symptoms. Chiropractic may help with some of the joint issues. Cryotherapy, hydrotherapy are also helpful for arthritic symptoms and inflammation. Um, maybe counseling should, should be put here as well because um, some people are quite self-conscious 
uh, of the psoriasis and develop uh, anxiety, depression over it. So counseling can be quite helpful too. Phototherapy. Although uh, sunshine is often regarded as harmful to our skin, the reality is it's very healthy in a variety of ways, and certain UV frequencies are very beneficial because they promote vitamin D synthesis. But there's other forms of phototherapy that, um, you know, artificial UV radiation, which we'll talk about in a minute. Herbal remedies, of course, there's a number of herbs that are good anti-inflammatories, good painkillers, and there's other natural compounds that are good for psoriasis and arthritis in general. Omega-3 fats, uh, GLA, various vitamins, minerals, uh, and even MSM, which I'll discuss in more detail. Phototherapy or light therapy. This involves exposing the skin to ultraviolet uh, radiation on a regular basis and typically under medical supervision. The main key to success here is consistency of exposure or treatment. Although sunlight contains both UVB and UVA, it was discovered that UVB uh, is better for psoriasis because it penetrates the skin layers deeper. Short multiple exposures are recommended, starting with 5 to 10 minutes at a time and progressing up from there. Midday sun is the most intense and it carries the frequencies that stimulate vitamin D production in the skin. Keep in mind in most, most northern climates, even though it may be very sunny during certain days in the winter time, that sun does not carry the frequency, or at least the frequencies have been filtered out because of the angles, and uh, your skin will not be producing vitamin D when exposed to that. Avoiding overexposure, of course, is important. It may take several weeks to see improvement, but virtually everyone with psoriasis is helped with sun exposure. Ironically, some medications uh, used for psoriasis uh, increase sun sensitivity, increase the risk of burns, so caution must be used there. Uh, also, artificial UVB treatments are popular. There's two general types that are the most common, broadband and narrowband. Broadband light bulbs uh, release a wider range of UV. Uh, several studies indicate that narrowband UVB clears psoriasis faster and produces longer remissions. And uh, the frequency of treatment is about three times per week uh, for at least three months to get good results there. These UVB treatments are usually administered in a clinical setting, uh, but there are home units available. However, prescription from the doctor is needed. Laser treatments are also popular methods of reducing plaques. There's two main types, excimer and pulsed dye lasers. Excimer laser emits a high intensity UVB frequency, recently approved by the FDA uh, for treating localized plaques. Excimer lasers targets the select areas of skin affected by mild to moderate psoriasis, perhaps not the best for severe cases because there's just too much area to cover. Pulsed dye laser is also approved for treating chronic localized plaques. It's a bit different. It utilizes a dye and a different frequency of light, and it destroys the tiny blood vessels um, that supply the lesions and plaques. Laser treatments consist of 15 to 30 minute sessions usually, once every uh, one, two, or three weeks, depending. It usually takes between four to ten sessions to see good results, although it depends on the person and the severity of psoriasis. Tanning beds and sun lamps are also popular and typically don't need a doctor's prescription, but they mostly emit UVA light, and of course most of the benefits associated uh, with light therapy uh, and psoriasis is attributed to UVB. Uh, Surrealin with UVA, also called uh, PUVA. Um, as I mentioned, UVA is relatively ineffective unless it's used with a light sensitizing medication, which is what Surrealin is. And it can be administered topically or orally. Common uh, short term side effects with this drug are um, quite extreme nausea, itching and redness and irritation of the skin, which is ironic given that it's being used for psoriasis. 
There are many natural products that, when applied to the skin, can help reduce inflammation, pain, itching, etc. Uh, but these natural products aren't well studied, so there's not high quality clinical studies with these. Um, essentially, there's no money in it, so there's no real incentive to do it, really. Aloe vera gel is a classic uh, for psoriasis and other skin conditions. It's soothing, it's a decent antimicrobial and it's even a mild anti-inflammatory. But to keep in mind, aloe vera is not really a moisturizer per se. It's more of an astringent. Apple cider vinegar, uh, tea tree oil, also astringents, also good antimicrobials and can help with psoriasis. Camphor, menthol, uh, these are soothing compounds, uh, often anti-itch, which of course is important for psoriasis and many other skin conditions. Bathing with Epsom salts, which are very rich in magnesium, sea salts, baking soda, oilated oatmeal, and even covering the body or bathing in black mud is a fairly common and, and uh, uh, reasonably effective treatment also. Moisturizing, of course, is important because it helps prevent dry skin, reduces the inflammation, and it seems the heaviest or greasiest moisturizers work best at locking the water into the skin. Natural ones can include olive oil, vegetable oils, mineral oils, uh, jojoba oil or butter as it's called, lard, salted butter. Any of these things can be effective if you're going the natural route. Capsaicin cream, you know, quote unquote natural, of course it's a processed thing, but uh, it's derived from cayenne peppers, uh, a good, a strong product, the Therogen HP, 0.075% strength. Uh, typically relieves pain and itching by blocking the communication system of the nerves, specifically blocking substance P. Uh, it's also uh, quite helpful locally for psoriatic arthritis, uh, but it doesn't reduce swelling. And also, if you put a little bit too much of it, it can actually cause irritation and redness, which of course is counterproductive for psoriasis. A decent uh, herbal remedy, not only for psoriasis, but also for rheumatoid arthritis, is called Thunder God Vine. The root portion is used, has been used for many centuries, uh, and is an important part of traditional Chinese medicine. It's a very good anti-inflammatory and seems to suppress immune response which is why it's used for autoimmune conditions. It can reduce symptoms of PA and even RA quite well. It can be taken orally or applied topically. The problem is there's high rates of side effects, nausea, for example, um, so it can be tricky that way. Oral doses range from 180 to 570 milligrams daily for up to 20 weeks. It's not meant to be taken long term. Another decent herbal remedy Boswellia resin, also known as frankincense, it's shown good anti-inflammatory and immune system effects in lab and animal studies. The most effective component is called ACBA. Extract doses range from 250 to 1,000 milligrams daily, and compared to Thunder God Vine, it's a much safer herb to use long term. Turmeric root, commonly used for various arthritic problems. It contains curcumin, a strong anti-inflammatory and analgesic. Perhaps surprisingly, it does perform as well as ibuprofen and diclofenac in studies, but of course without any negative side effects. It has the ability to alter uh, TNF or tumor necrosis factor cytokine expression. That's how it reduces inflammation. Extract doses are between 300 to 600 milligrams three times daily for psoriatic arthritis and even RA, but it's also a blood thinner, so you have to be aware of that. Another good herbal remedy for psoriasis, at least uh, the PA aspect of it, is Mahonia aquifolium or Oregon grape. So it's a strong antimicrobial herb that plays a role in immune response. Some studies show that applying a cream containing 10% Mahonia is effective in treating mild to moderate psoriasis. Uh, 
uh, but perhaps not the best choice for severe examples. Omega-3 fats uh, are quite good for a variety of inflammatory conditions and arthritic conditions. And these include ALA, EPA, and DHA compounds. They are strongly anti-inflammatory. They also aid in tissue repair. EPA and DHA are found in fish oils, whereas ALA is primarily in flaxseed, hemp, and even walnuts. I would think at least a thousand milligrams two to four times daily would help reduce uh, psoriasis, not only the skin psoriasis, but also PA. Uh, borage seed oil, uh, another good supplement. It's the richest source of gamma linolenic acid, or GLA, although other sources do include black currant uh, seed oil and evening primrose oil. These borage seed oil supplements uh, can be taken orally or even spread on the skin in isolate, isolated plaque areas. GLA inhibits leukotrienes and it demonstrates anti-inflammatory effects quite well. In terms of the PA, I would think 1 to 3 grams daily for at least 24 weeks would show some good results. Again, it can be applied directly to the plaques. Vitamin D can be helpful. The official RDA is between 600 and 800 IUs per day, which is ridiculously low. A person uh, in a bathing suit standing in midday sun for half an hour uh, produces tens of thousands of IUs uh, of vitamin D. And of course, we're talking about vitamin D3, very safe. And that would be the supplement of choice, the D3 variety. It turns out a significant percentage of psoriasis patients and rheumatoid arthritis patients are vitamin D deficient. And don't forget, vitamin D has been, you know, many decades ago, was essentially misclassified. It's not really a hormone-like vitamin. It's really more of a vitamin-like hormone. And it's essential for strong immunity and skin health. In terms of the D3, uh, up to at least 40,000 IUs a day is considered safe. I wouldn't necessarily recommend supplementing with that. That might be uh, overkill to a certain extent. And of course, the, the safest and cheapest way of getting it is exposing your skin to summer sunshine. B-complex vitamins uh, are very important for a variety of skin conditions, including psoriasis. Um, there are eight related compounds. Not all of them are related to skin health, but most of them are. B2 or riboflavin, B3, niacin, B7, biotin uh, are likely the most important for skin health. And I would recommend simply taking a strong B-complex, often called B-complex 100s, are probably the most convenient and cost-effective. Uh, of the B-complex vitamins, B6 is really the only one that carries any toxicity risk. And I would say as long as you're not taking many, many B100s daily, any risk of toxicity is extremely low. Zinc, also important for skin health. Interestingly, the skin contains 20% of the body's zinc supply. Studies on zinc-deficient rodents have proven that they develop uh, keratinogenesis, which is very similar to psoriasis, so there is some kind of a link with that. And zinc deficiency in Americans is quite common, actually, perhaps uh, up to 40-50% of the population, at least mildly deficient in zinc. The RDA of zinc is 15 milligrams, which is quite low, but up to 500 milligrams per day from supplements is quite safe, although for skin issues, Recommendations usually are between 50 to 100 milligrams daily. MSM, standing for methyl methane, is a very good source of organic sulfur, uh, helpful for the skin and also other soft tissues and joint issues. Um, it's needed for chondroitin sulfate production in the joints. So MSM is not only good for global inflammation, but is quite helpful for any types of arthritis. It's also a mild analgesic. In terms of dosage, three to 4,000 milligrams two times per day can make a very good impact on arthritic pain and may help 
with the skin inflammation and plaques, although that's not its main role, it's more for the arthritic conditions. Obviously the main purpose of drug therapy for psoriasis is to minimize the inflammation and pain, not only from the skin lesions or plaques, but also uh, for the arthritis if that's present. There are a number of medications used, uh, both topically and systemically for psoriasis. There's over-the-counter NSAIDs, prescription NSAIDs, steroidal anti-inflammatories, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, also known as DMARDs, and older immune suppressants like cyclosporin. Medications are not curative, of course. They simply deal with the symptoms, and some of them actually accelerate joint destruction with long-term use, and I'm talking about some of the NSAIDs. I'll discuss that in a little greater detail shortly. Uh, topical corticosteroids, such as Topicort, are quite popular because they reduce inflammation and slow down the production of skin cells but they also suppress the immune response, which may be beneficial short-term, but certainly isn't long-term. These topical corticosteroid creams recommended for active outbreaks of psoriasis. Long-term use or overuse can cause many symptoms, including thinning of the skin. Vitamin D analogs are also common and popular, such as brand names like Dovonex. There's synthetic vitamin D creams that control skin cell turnover. But vitamin D can also stimulate immunity, so it depends on your position if psoriasis is due to an overactive immune system. If that's your thought process, then taking vitamin D products might be uh, counterproductive or counterintuitive. Retinoids, of course, are very popular. Tazerotene, uh, the genetic, it comes in, uh, this is a synthetic vitamin A cream, supposedly normalizes DNA activity in skin cells may also de decrease inflammation somewhat. However, it increases sensitivity to light, and it's certainly not appropriate during pregnancy. Coal tar, commonly applied to the skin for psoriasis. Brand names, Eltatar or Neutrogena T-Gel, applied directly to the skin, or Scalp, uh, and it's supposed to reduce scaling, itching, and inflammation. The problem with the coal tar products, they're quite messy, very strong odor. They can stain clothing, bedding, and they can even stain or irritate the skin if you take a little bit too much of them. Anthralin, also known as dithranol, are ointments, creams, or pastes that reduce the supply of energy to cells and impede DNA replication, so it slows the excessive cell division that is common with psoriasis, but these are also best for short-term use. In fact, uh, they stain the skin and anything around the skin quite readily. So typically, once this topical is applied, it should be wiped off or cleaned off after about 15 minutes. Calcinorin inhibitors, brand names Prograf, Alito, uh, they're approved for atopic dermatitis, but some studies show they can be effective for psoriasis plaques also. They disrupt the T-cell activation, which of course reduces inflammation and plaque buildup. They're not recommended for long-term use or even continuous use because they have an increased risk of skin cancer and lymphoma. Salicylic acid is a good peeling agent. And it comes as ointments, creams, gels, shampoos, all sorts of products. It promotes the sloughing off of dead skin, which reduces scaling. There's also salicylate creams over the counter, such as Bengay, which can be applied to um, inflamed joints, as seen with PA. Even lubricants such as petroleum jelly can be effective. They have a soothing effect, and of course they conceal water into the skin and reduce scaling and itching. However, petroleum jellies, uh, any petroleum product really gets applied to the skin, even coal tars uh, over long-term use have shown to be mildly carcinogenic. So heavy long-term use of these products is discouraged. Uh, certain effective uh, over-the-counter thick moisturizers include Neutrogena Norwegian Formula Cream, Eucerin, Aquaphor, there's a variety of other ones that, that work quite well.
covering the psoriasis legion, lesions, uh, like with saran wrap or plastic wrap, is actually quite helpful too, uh, especially if you're using a topical, because it tends to seal it in and prevent evaporation. Over-the-counter non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs. The primary over-the-counter NSAIDs for uh, PA are ibuprofen, brand names Advil, Motrin, Naproxen, Aleve, and ASA, Aspirin, or Anacin. NSAIDs help relieve the pain and inflammation of PA and other arthritic conditions, but they have a fairly high incidence of side effects, mainly to do with the stomach. In terms of risk of serious stomach problems, ASA products are the worst, followed by naproxen, followed by ibuprofen in terms of risk. Most NSAIDs increase risk of heart attack, but naproxen does not. ASA is a non-selective COX inhibitor, but of course it reduces more COX-1. Ibuprofen, naproxen, also non-selective, but they're more of the COX-2, which is why they're a little bit better for the stomach. Doses is for PA, uh, or even RA, or severe OA. ASA, 1,000 milligrams, three times daily. Ibuprofen, 400 to 800 milligrams every six hours, to a maximum of 3,200 milligrams. Naproxen, uh, 250 to 550 milligrams twice daily, to a maximum of 1,650 milligrams. And again, there is some evidence that indicates long-term use of these NSAIDs can accelerate cartilage erosion and connective tissue breakdown and joint destruction. So it's ironic because they're typically given long-term for a variety of arthritic conditions, but it can actually accelerate destruction. Uh, COX-2 inhibitors, such as Celebrex, uh, selectively in inhibit only COX-2 which is why they're much, much easier on the stomach, but they have a much higher risk of myocardial infarction and stroke, which is why the FDA removed, or I guess the, the actual drug companies removed them from the market, but I suppose the FDA strongly suggested that they do so. Vioxx was removed in 2004, Vextra in 2005. Quite unusual for a drug company to go to this lengths. Um, so obviously there are some serious issues with those drugs. Celebrex remains, however, doses for PA and RA or even severe OA are typically 100 to 200 milligrams twice daily. Indomethacin is a common uh, arthritic drug, but it can actually make skin psoriasis worse, so it's not often recommended, but it does have quite minimal side effects, so there's... Um, there's a balance there between benefit and side effects. Diclofenac, brand names Molterin, Cataflam, is an acetic acid derivative oral dosage for PA, severe PA, or RA even, is between 150 and 200 milligrams daily in two to four divided doses. Diflucinal, brand name Dolobid, is a carboxylic acid derivative Oral dosage for severe PA is between 500 and 1,000 milligrams daily in two divided doses. Ketoprofen or Rudis uh, was available over the counter in the U.S., but now by prescription, dosage for PA, uh, severe PA or RA is 200 milligrams extended release once daily. Um, ketoprofen based power gel, the 2.5% strength is also available for topical application. Corticosteroids such as cortisone, prednisone, and prednisolone are strong anti-inflammatories that mimic the adrenal hormones of the body. They also suppress immunity quite strongly, which is helpful short-term for so-called autoimmune conditions such as psoriasis or rheumatoid arthritis, but not for health in general. Obviously, we need functioning immune systems for health. Cortisone injections are sometimes given for severe PA, but psoriasis is more of a systemic, widespread condition, so pills, creams, and intranasal sprays are more common here. For uh, PA, low-dose corticosteroids are typically 7.5 milligrams daily and are used as a bit of a bridge therapy until the slower-acting DMARDs kick in. 
This is a strategy also used for rheumatoid arthritis. Larger doses, such as 25 milligrams daily, are only used short-term to treat the flares. Unfortunately, corticosteroids have a variety of side effects that are quite common, including edema, weight gain, uh, hypertension, eye pressure, which can lead to glaucoma, mood swings, fatigue, slow healing, more infections, thin skin, easy bruising, and also osteoporosis. So they have to be used with caution. As I noted, DMARDs are disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. They work fairly slowly to modify the course of psoriasis and other uh, autoimmune conditions such as RA. They promote remission and prevent joint destruction. The most common DMARD in general uh, for autoimmune conditions, but specifically for PA, is methotrexate, brand names Rheumatrex, Trexol, Folex. It was actually approved by the FDA back in the 70s for treatment of severe psoriasis and is quite effective in reducing the symptoms of PA. Methotrexate is actually a folic acid antagonist, binds and inhibits an enzyme involved in the rapid growth of skin cells, slows down the growth rate. However, if you take methotrexate, it's recommended to supplement with folate or folic acid. Dosages of methotrexate start at usually 7.5 to 10 milligrams, which is 3 to 4 pills once per week. The dose can be increased up to 25 milligrams a week over time, and the time to effect uh, with psoriasis can be within 3 weeks, but it's usually closer to uh, 3 to 4 months. Also available as a liquid or an injection, and is used often in combination with other NSAIDs and or steroids. However, methotrexate does increase liver enzymes in about 15% or so of patients, and is teratogenic, so obviously not appropriate for women planning pregnancy. If methotrexate or other conventional DMARs are not effective after about three months or so, then other so-called biological agents are considered. Biologics is short for biologic response modifiers, and they are a relatively newer drug category uh, used for psoriasis and RA, and are actually a subset of the DMARDs. However, they all must be injected. These biologics block specific steps in the inflammation process, so they are good in the sense that they don't wipe out the entire immune uh, response like corticosteroids do. Biologics used to treat psoriasis act specifically by blocking the action of T cells and cytokines, such as TNF alpha and various interleukins. The TNF inhibitors include Amivive, Enbrel, Humira, Remicade, Symponi. Stellara is another biologic. It works by targeting interleukin 12 and interleukin 23 which are very closely associated with psoriasis. Kineret is less effective. It blocks interleukin-1, which is not as important in psoriasis as it would be in rheumatoid arthritis, for example. Biologics are effective in controlling inflammation and preventing joint deformity, but they are quite expensive, and they do induce many side effects, including severe nausea, diarrhea, hair loss, and risk of serious infections, particularly TB. Oral retinoids. As mentioned, these are synthetic vitamin A drugs, and they may reduce production of skin cells with severe psoriasis, although the ways in which they work is unknown. Psoriatane, or acetratin, is the generic is the only oral retinoid approved by the FDA for treating psoriasis that tends to work quite slowly at reducing the plaques, often up to six months as necessary to see the peak effects. There are a number of side effects with this drug, including dryness of the skin and mucous membranes, itching, and hair loss. It should be noted that retinoids can cause severe birth defects, so women must avoid pregnancy for up to three years after taking this medication because it does take quite some time to break these drugs down and get rid of them from the body. So Reotane comes in 10 milligram and 25 milligram capsules. 
Obviously, several factors influence dosage, including the type and severity of the cirrhosis. Accutane is sometimes used as a replacement of cereotane. Uh, it's used in an off-label fashion for psoriasis, and there's a number of other drugs that are used off-label too, which we'll get to in the next slide. There's a variety of other potential therapies that are being investigated, and some of these include molecules that target and interrupt cellular signaling. For example, the JAK inhibitors block the Janus kinase pathways, which are involved in the body's immune response. The benefit of these inhibitors over the DMARDs is that they can be taken orally. The newest JAK drug is tofacitinib, if I pronounce that correctly, and is approved currently to treat RA, but it has shown pretty good results in treating uh, severe plaque psoriasis also. Uh, sick inhibitors uh, block the spleen tyrosine kinase pathway, and these work particularly well with methotrexate. Primalast is a phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor and may also be a promising agent for the treatment of psoriasis, but I suppose time will tell.